Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service of the Salvation Army, Lindsay Community Church. We're so glad that you're joining with us, and our hope is that you feel the presence of the Lord as we worship together, even though we're not together face-to-face. -to -face. But September 12th is coming, and that's the day of our opening, and it's only four weeks away, less than a month. Isn't that great? That is great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing all of your faces again. And uh, I pray that God continues to heal our land of this COVID virus. Remember those on our health prayer list, uh, Shannon Switzer, Major Linda Walmer, Ruth Barber, and Lois Bryan. And as always, remember Morty Danes and Lucy Pelly are in long-term care homes, so keep them in your prayers as well. Nothing new in any of these announcements um, because it's summer and because we're still in COVID. So just remember the food bank as well as they're always in need of donations. And uh, there's a list of those don donations in the bulletin that they really require at this time. So, uh, and you can drop those off at the back door, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at the loading dock. Just ring the bell and someone will get there to assist you. The call to worship this morning is from Psalm, actually from three different verses in the Bible. Psalm 40, verse 8. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Psalm 143 and 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. And from Romans 12 and 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will.
I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. Lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams, laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of. Good morning, church family. Happy to be joining you. The countdown is on. I hope you've had a good week. It's uh, been a, a, a real hard thinking week, kind of, for me. Systematic theology was the flavor of the week, and I can say I've come out a little wiser. I can say I've come out a lot more humble, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a week. I hope your week has been one that's challenged you spiritually given you encouragement and hope, and that today, or whenever you're listening to this, the moment you're listening to this, that you've grown in your relationship with God just a little more than yesterday. How about that? The scripture, of course, we're continuing on in James. Uh, Bob is, I think he has two weeks left of his James series. And uh, I'm just going to read you the scripture this morning. It is found in James chapter 4. I'm reading from the New International uh, Version. If you'd like to grab your Bibles or have a listen, but it's always good. Good to read scripture. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. And we've had different topics covered last week. Uh, We were talking about um, submitting yourself to God. And then this week, um, it's talking about boasting about tomorrow. And the thing I kind of find funny was when, uh, you know, we've we've said, we're coming to Lindsay, we're coming to Lindsay. And then when we got appointed to Lindsay, we were really excited. And we're like, okay, so we have 15 years technically, um, God willing, a lot more. But you know, I I can't really boast and say that we're going to be here because it's whatever God wants. And hopefully it'll be a while, but uh, you'll get it by the scripture today. So uh, James chapter four, verses 13 to 17, and boasting about tomorrow is um, the subtitle for today's scripture reading. Now, listen, you who say tomorrow or today, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Evil. If anyone then knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Did you catch that? If you know you're supposed to be doing something and you don't do it, that's something that separates you from God. So I trust the reading, well, I know the reading will not return void this morning. And I just pray that you're not just blessed and made to feel good by the scripture. Because really, the scripture is saying it, it's not your plans. It's God's plan. And we need to submit to those plans. But I'll save the preaching for Bob today. Okay. But I would like you to join me um, in the prayer this morning. So if you would uh, just bow your heads, close your eyes, or just sit. Sit and stare out a window at God's beautiful creation. However you're finding your situation today, we're just going to pause. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you that you have given us another day to live out what you have called us to do. Bring people into our lives that we can show your grace and kindness to, but not only to show them, but to tell them as well. Give us opportunities to witness both in, in our actions and our words and our deeds and and, and give us opportunity to really just speak into people's lives, your grace and your mercy and your love. Father, I think of how glorious you are and how perfect and wonderful. And I'm humbled that you've chosen us to be your people. I thank you for opportunities this week, for our learnings this week, Father. I pray for those who've had tests done. There's been quite a few medical procedures and tests done this week. And God, I pray that, um, well, we know you were with our people. We know that you care for them. Father, just give them the strength and the courage and the patience and the, uh, the comfort that they need now, that we need now, um, to sit in your presence and um, do what we can do. And sometimes, Father, that doing is just sitting and listening. Thank you that we can do that as well. Father, I thank you for the victories that have been won this week. And I thank you for those challenges that have pressed us to press into you more. God, we think of this coming week and, and people preparing to go back to work and children preparing to go to school. And and those preparing to go on holiday and take a break, Father, we think of those people and we ask that you be with them and you strengthen them and you guide them in their word and their deed. Father, I just thank you again for the opportunity to come before you to have a service. And Father, that your church, we're just a small piece of your church. And we thank you for that. We thank you that we share with brothers and sisters, not just locally, but internationally across this world, Father. There are other Christians gathering at this same moment. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that great cloud of witness that has gone on before us. I pray, Father, right now that as your spirit has directed Bob this week to speak on James and just the conviction of knowing and doing what you've called us to do, Father, I pray that you touch hearts, that you touch minds, and that you touch not only individuals to follow your will, but families and neighbors and our community to learn from you and then go out into our world and be your vessels. <clears throat> your Holy Spirit dwells with us. So as we walk into the communities, Father, as we sit here and listen to what you would have for us today, Father, I pray that you give us ears to hear. Because we love you. Bless us. Bless Bob as he brings your word. Amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory.
morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, thank you, Susan, for reading the scripture earlier. Uh, last week, uh, well, first of all, today we're looking at James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Um, but to recap a bit of last week, uh, we spoke about selfish desires and we spoke about motives for the sake of getting our own, our own desires, our pleasures, our selfish pleasures. Um, James placed this into a context of covening and fighting to get them. And he compared this friendship with the world um, as enmity towards God. He used the words adulterous people to give the picture of the church being the bride of Christ and yet giving themselves over to the world instead of remaining faithful to God. Now, James's warning to remain faithful uh, was encased or enveloped in hope. And when he says God's grace is ready, available for us, when we do find that we've wanted the world more than God. He tells us God will accept us uh, when we turn back to him and submit our wills back to him. It's it's a, a relational thing with God where he reaches into his creation and is interested in our lives. It's really a, a beautiful picture of God who desires for us to experience his love and forgiveness while still being a holy God who requires justice and our faithfulness. So in this, though, there's also a warning uh, to not slander each other because only God sees the heart inside of us. Um, and today we're going to turn to verses 13 to 17 and see uh, the continuation of chapter 4. First, we're presented with the thought that in verse 13 says, uh, continues in the idea of being careful about the decisions we make and the actions we take. To be careful that we don't make assumptions that we can control future outcomes by what we choose. In essence, James is warning uh, further about the potential we have to become prideful and to not consider God's desires for our life. To not look for or listen for his purposes and instead proudly boast about what we will do uh, in our own efforts. Perkins, a uh, commentator, says... The readers may be so caught up in their pursuits that they forget that they are radically dependent on God. And I think sometimes we find ourselves in that place where the world starts to become something in our minds that we're in, in full control of and, and we can create our own destinies maybe. But God still remains sovereign and is still involved in his creation. And we can't forget that. Sometimes we don't think about this taking control for ourselves. And usually this happens because we find ourselves distanced from God. It could happen in business or under time pressures or family and peer pressures. Maybe you had a dream to achieve a particular thing in life. And that thing in and of itself isn't a right or wrong thing, but in the pursuit, you became more involved with it than you were concerned with your relationship with God. If it starts going well from your perspective, it might even make the distance from God seem like God is in the results. But certain results aren't a guarantee that you're close to God or that it's him that is causing what may seem to be a blessing. And the reality James is reminding us of is we're not in control. God is. So don't deceive yourself, believer. And so we find ourselves sometimes living out the results of our plans, realizing we left God somewhere behind in our intentions. Now, James brings his reader back to the spiritual reality that we sometimes forget. And when we do forget, we find we have forgotten God often or tried to control God for our own benefit. Verse 14 reminds us that not only don't we know what is going to happen, nor can we control what is going to happen. Our lives are like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He closes that line of thinking in verse 16, claiming that plans like these, made out of arrogance and looking for our own desires, are likened to arrogant schemes, saying all such boasting is evil. So why the warning? The quick answer is because James Listeners were missing something when it came to submitting to God. 
the thought for us today is, are there times we do the same thing? Or if we look at our personal and corporate lives as part of the church, are there priorities um, we have we have that maybe we didn't take time to see if God has led us to them by his spirit and through his word? James isn't telling this to them, and for us, this isn't to be heard to condemn us. No, he brings clarity to our intentions, to frame them with God's solution of grace and protection. And now in the middle of verses 14 and 16, we see shadows of verse 7, which tells us to submit to God, and verse 8, which tells us if we draw near to God, he will draw near or come near to us. Verse 15 tells us we should say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Can you see the difference between proud self, the proud self-directed heart that is moving onward only to get what it feels will fill its thirst for desire compared to the humble heart that while it makes plans throughout, it desires God to lead so that he will be honored. His desires for our lives will be accomplished and the purpose of his church will be fulfilled. A humility that allows for things to change as God wills and still remains faithful because that heart knows God is sovereign and that God desires what is good in accomplishing growth and spiritual maturity in his children and in the church. This is a heart that trusts a heart that has faith in God. Not a heart that forgets about God and tries to create its own destiny outside of desiring God's leading. So in the midst of life and work and family, when we're striving to honor God in our plans for the future and in our immediate needs and tasks, what can keep us on track as the body of Christ, as the church? In verse 17, we see the focus of these verses. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now, this week, Susan and I uh, were in a week-long intensive course called The Church in Salvation Army Ecclesiology. There's a word for you. So I'll say that again. The Church in Salvation Army Ecclesiology. Uh, or Salvation Army Theology, I should say, looking at the idea of mission and church and where and how they fit together. If we look at today's scripture, the warnings and solutions fit into this in certain ways. We often forget that as God's church, we have a purpose, and that purpose is found in the mission of the church. Like the nation of Israel in Old Testament times uh, was to be an example to the nations around them, of what a society that worships and serves God as king looks like. The church, we are to be a people that are set apart to live personal and corporate lives that represent Christ to the world around us, inviting them to experience God's love and recognize the beauty of him changing perceptions of our thoughts, where the lives we would live to please ourselves become lives that surrender to his will and to his ways. Really, a life led by his word and by his spirit. And in God's sovereign will, his plan for us as the church is to point others to what he has planned for us when Christ returns. A foreshadowing of a people set apart for God where sin no longer has a hold, but where his children worship and serve him free from sin free from the influences of sin, and where he speaks to and actively loves his children, a community of believers who worship their God in word and in action. See, the things we do and the plans we make as the church, we are reminded, should never take place from a position of personal control, but from a place of personal surrender. In this surrender, we discover the good that we should do, and we find ourselves in the relationship with God where doing it is because we love him and want to honor him. To not do it shows that prideful heart that doesn't want to surrender to God. Perspective means everything. 
when we understand our purpose, we have a world of freedom to be creative within that framework. Where some might say the church is too controlling and, and people should be able to do what they want, God's word reminds us that freedom really is a, like a mirage when we understand that without Christ, we are slaves to a sinful nature that we have through the fall of Adam and Eve in their disobe disobedience to God early in creation. So biblically speaking, freedom comes when we receive the gift of salvation from sin that God offers us through his grace. It's then that we truly experience what we were created for, to worship and honor God and experience his adoption of us as his children, both in our personal relationship with him and corporately, as the family of God. And those things we at one time would die for to get our way lose their hold on us when compared to knowing God. It's then that we find ourselves living and working and being in family and friendship where God's purpose becomes clear. And I mean clear in the sense of recognizing he is with us through life and we will be with him in eternity. Where we can make decisions, but for those decisions to be surrendered to him and not trying to get him to surrender to what we want to do. Remember these words from the commentator Perkins. He says, James does not object to the occupation of trading as such. And this is in relation to the scripture today. Nor is he concerned about the merchant's desire to make money. The problem lies in the arrogant confidence that conceals the fact that we really depend on God for success. Now, if you find yourself, if I find myself in a place where you or I, we are holding on to something, maybe where you've had dreams about this one thing and you've put all of your energies into it, and now you find yourself not sure if it began out of prideful or selfish motives, James is reminding us to go to God, to turn it around and begin to let him lead you once more. And let us, as a church family, always be encouraging each other, whether the youngest child, the paid pastor, or the oldest senior, to surrender to God's leading. We are his church, and we are to represent what it will be when his kingdom comes in fullness when Christ returns. That is a future that is better than anything else we could hope for. And that puts us in a present tense of something better than we could ever hope for. In deep relationship with a God who is involved in our lives and leads us daily through his word and through his spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, James has the book of James has such a practical side to it, but that practical is always enveloped with your spirit working in us as well. And it's enveloped within your sovereign will as well. And Lord, it's a mystery. And sometimes the only takeout that I can take home that I can sometimes hold on to is that you desire for us to know you. And you have a plan for us. And through salvation, your spirit comes to live within us as your children. And Lord, if you love us that much and you show us in your word that even though we fail, we can turn to you and you will hold us close again. Lord, it lets me know, it lets our church family know, it lets your church universal know that you are a God we can place our trust in. And you are a God that is faithful to us and you help us to be faithful to you in return not to be slaves in the sense of you control us to do horrible things, but so that we can understand that submission to you is all about knowing you more and knowing your love more and experiencing your purpose for us that leads us through salvation and into eternity with you. Help us, Lord, to be a church that, like your intention for the Israelites, represents you well and shows the world that you are our king. 
Lord, we ask these things in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
thank you for joining us this morning. I, I know listening, I've uh, been able to glean some things that I've been challenged with, and I pray that this week, the Lord willing, um, through the help of his Holy Spirit, I'm able to do those things that God has asked me to do, and I pray that for you as well. The benediction this morning is based, and commission, is based on James uh, chapters 3 and 4. Receive this this morning. Go out, clothed in strength and dignity. Submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. Delight in the Lord's teaching. Open your hands to the poor and let your actions arise from the wisdom of God. And may God draw near to you and strengthen you. May Christ Jesus teach you the ways of simplicity and may the Holy Spirit fill you with wisdom and make you fruitful in peace and in righteousness. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Cause we were the blood.